Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining us at the investiture of Professor Richard Kaplan as the Guy Raymond Jones Chair in Law. Uh, I'm Vic Amar, the Dean at the College of Law, and it's wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues, students and others here to celebrate this significant occasion. I'd like to extend a special welcome to Dick's family who are here with us today, Dick's wife Judy, uh, their daughter Rachel, and their, uh, their son David and his girlfriend Marina. Thank you so much for coming. The investiture is a well-established tradition in academia designed to acknowledge and honor faculty members who, over the course of their careers, have shown exemplary achievement in the three areas that we uh, faculty members are supposed to um, work in, that is scholarship, teaching, and public engagement. An investiture of someone as a chair, as we have today, uh, honors the very, the very highest level of such academic accomplishment. In addition to celebrating our honorees and their family and friends, an investiture provides an opportunity to honor and thank donors whose vision and generosity make academic excellence possible. The Guy Raymond Jones Chair in Law derives from a very generous estate gift from the late Mildred Van Voorhees Jones on behalf of her father, Guy Raymond Jones, who was a graduate of the College of Law class of 1902. We are grateful, indeed very grateful, to the Jones family and Mildred's commitment to the University of Illinois, and they are in our thoughts today. Representing the Jones family here today is Lot Thomas, also a graduate of the College of Law, 1962, nice to see you, who assisted the Jones family in making their generous gift to the college that funded this named position. We are also delighted this afternoon to be joined by a distinguished campus leader, Dr. William Bernhard, Vice Pro Provost for Academic Affairs. Uh, Dr. Bernhard provides stellar leadership for the entire campus across all areas of academic and faculty affairs. So please join me in welcoming him to the podium to offer a few remarks. Bill? Good afternoon. Thank you, Vic. Thank you for uh, uh, inviting me to participate in the celebration of excellence and the achievements of Professor Kaplan. As a faculty member, I know and understand what it takes to achieve this level of accomplishment over the course of a career. It's more than just being smart. It's more than just having an inspiration. It takes years of dedication, it takes diligence, it takes tenacity to see those ideas through and to achieve the level of excellence that merits such a distinction. So on behalf of the provost, the interim provost John Wilkin, and the rest of the campus leadership, let me offer my hearty congratulations to Professor Kaplan. Now when I am asked to do these things, I usually like to take a, a, a few minutes to familiarize myself with the research accomplishments of the honoree. Uh, and when, I uh, probably shouldn't say this, but when I first uh, looked up Professor Kaplan and saw that he, he did tax law, I thought to myself, wow, he must have a great sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyer jokes and tax jokes combined. <laughs> must have heard them all. But as I read more about his accomplishments and everything he's contributed to our campus, I began to reflect and think about the mission of our university as a land-grant institution. At Illinois, we are called upon to address important societal issues to push the boundaries of knowledge on those issues forward, and then to take that knowledge and share it with, with society, to share it with our students, and to push it out uh, into the community. Professor Kaplan has done all of those things. He is emblematic of that mission. He addresses important issues, thinking about uh, uh, equity and fairness in our society. He's been an award-winning teacher, sharing those ideas here in the classroom. And he's also participated in our uh, national debates uh, uh, about the proper course of taxation. He's worked, uh, appeared before Congress, and I think more importantly, he's also shared his knowledge with the wider community, helping to make what many view as an arcane and intimidating area accessible to a wider population. 
I think he truly represents the best of what the University of Illinois has to offer, and I'm very, very pleased to be part uh, here to congratulate him on those accomplishments. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. And we now turn more directly to the man of the hour. Professor Richard Kaplan graduated from Indiana University with highest honors and then earned his law degree from Yale University. He practiced law at uh, the firm of Baker and Botts in Houston, specializing in the United States tax consequences of on, upon international transactions. He joined the College of Law faculty in 1979, and since then he has earned a well-deserved, internationally uh, recognized acclaim as an expert on U.S. tax law and policy. He's lectured on these topics on three continents, testified before Congress on several occasions, and written innovative course books on income taxation and international taxation. Professor Kaplan developed one of the first law school courses in the country on elder law, an emerging specialty dealing with the legal implications of extended life, and is the co-author of Elder Law in a Nutshell, um, uh, which is a book that uh, a lot of lawyers and legal academics use to get a, a, a deep introduction to this important field. He has served as faculty advisor for the Elder Law Journal, one of the stellar student-run publications uh, here at the law school since its inception in 1992. He's also been recognized with the Outstanding Professor Award in the College of Law several times and has received the Campus Award for Excellence in Graduate and Professional Teaching. Professor Kaplan is a fellow of the Employee Benefits Research Institute and a member of the National Academy of Social Insurance. His writing and research are highly regarded by his peers. His colleagues praise him as, quote, a trusted analyst. We read his work when we want to pierce the thicket and understand what is really at stake. This is true not only for elder law, because Dick, quote, is also one of the leading scholars in the general field of social welfare policy and law. Another colleague remarked on how he, quote, demonstrates the kind of creativity that comes from carefully working out the, the multifold legal consequences uh, uh, of different decisions. And yet another colleague says, Dick is not an ivory tower academic. His writing shows sensitivity to real world considerations. This is a law professor who understands law on the ground. Notwithstanding all that, a number of people remarked on how, quote, he is someone uh, of not just great stature, an internationally renowned expert, but someone with a well-deserved reputation for kindness and generosity. His passion and expertise are as apparent in the classroom as they are in his writings. His students say he is, quote, awesome and very funny, <laughs> and among, quote, the best instructors in the College of Law. One observed that, quote, Kaplan has no weaknesses. He is the gold standard of a professor. I have never enjoyed such a dull topic so much. <laughs> if only all professors could be like him. And as for suggestions for improvement, another student said, nothing. The man is a saint. <laughs> Yet, yet another summarized by saying, quote, I don't know where to begin from memorizing every student's name on day one to regularly breaking into song in class, <laughs> Professor Kaplan made every class engaging and rewarding. On a personal note, let me say I may not be here but for uh, Dick Kaplan and uh, what he stands for at this college and this university. He was on the search committee uh, for a dean when I was uh, a candidate, uh, and uh, he was one of the people on the committee that really impressed me and uh, made me want to look more uh, carefully at this uh, opportunity for which I am very glad. A respected colleague, a thoughtful scholar, an engaged teacher, Dick, it is my privilege today to recognize your many accomplishments and confer you upon you this honor you have most clearly earned. So if you would please stand, I will present you with the medallion marking your investiture as the, gay, the Guy Raymond Jones Chair in Law, and then we'll hear from you for a few minutes. Thanks. Thank so let's put this on here gently. <laughs> And congratulations. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Vic. And I want to acknowledge with great thanks everybody who came from a variety of walks of life, uh, some of whom had never been in this building before. And so I'm particularly grateful that you made the journey. There is nothing that will kill an audience faster than to go through a whole bunch of thank yous. So I would, I will abstain from thanking some of my good friends who are deans here. But there are two people who really must be thanked individually. First is Molly Lindsay, my hardworking assistant who I've been with now for nine years. Uh, she has kept things running and kept calm when all kinds of snafus with technology have made that virtually impossible. And finally, uh, I have to, of course, thank my beloved wife, Judy, who has read every article in the penultimate draft and has <laughs> provided insights uh, to gaps that have been made and perhaps other suggestions as well in many other respects, of course. Uh, she does so much to, in the words of the ancient blessing, to sustain me and enable me to reach this day. Thank you very much, Judy. In this first hour, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I had planned to discuss the basic outlines of the Health Care Reform Act. <laughs> and to talk in great detail about what was also supposed to have been enacted this summer, namely the tax reform bill uh, under President Trump. Uh, needless to say, that's not what we're going to talk about because that has not happened. And so that's basically what I'm going to talk about, namely, why hasn't it happened? And as you can see, uh, the uh, theme is uh, uh, health care and income tax reform. Uh, how hard can it be? And uh, <laughs> short answer is that apparently can be pretty hard. Uh, <laughs> Let's begin with health care reform first. Uh, and I should add that one can say sort of what is my interest in health care? And I think that is a very important uh, question. There are really two, uh, one that is more obvious than the other. Uh, the first is that, as both speakers have indicated, elder law deals with the law of uh, older people. And there are a few programs that are more fundamental to older people's continued existence, literally, than Medicare. Medicare is very much a part of the health care system, if that's what we would call it in the United States. And accordingly, that is uh, the direct involvement with health care. The other more indirect involvement actually relates to the tax code, and that will be coming up in a few minutes. So what you have in front of you is a graph that appeared uh, this week in the online version of the New England Journal of Medicine. And in many ways, it explains both uh, much of the difficulty, the animosity with which Obamacare was enacted, and also the difficulty with which any efforts to repeal it are taking place. So what we see here is that one year before the actual effective date of most of Obamacare, uh, the binary proposition of is it or is it not the responsibility of the federal government to ensure that all Americans have health coverage, we see that in 2013 that actually the majority by a significant percentage said it was not the responsibility of the federal government and that therefore this was seen as a bit of an intrusion. One of the remarkable collections of surveys, and these are primarily from the Pew Research Group, uh, shows that the blue line has uh, diminished over time in a relatively short period so that by 2015 it is actually the red line representing it is the responsibility of the federal government to ensure that all Americans have health coverage has actually become the majority and I'm not sure I would attribute this latest interval entirely to Donald Trump but one seeming accomplishment he has made is to expand <laughs> this interval so that now people who think that it is the federal government's responsibility are in a majority where that delta the differential is actually greater than it has been in the history of polling on this subject. Having said that, that the majority has now uh, responds, and that was June of 2017, that in fact most people think the federal government does have a responsibility to ensure all Americans have health coverage. There are many separate issues that make this whole project complicated and difficult to surmise. So even if we acknowledge that there is a role for the federal government, the next threshold issue is exactly what should that role be? Should it be the provision of care directly, 
or should it be merely the insurance? And the two paradigmatic examples would be in the case of direct provision, the Veterans Administration, which literally has doctors on its payroll as full-time employees, its own dedicated hospitals, its own nursing homes, and is a fully integrated system. Medicare, in contrast, has no Medicare doctors, hospitals, or nursing homes, but simply pays, technically reimburses, the services of private providers, and that the actual provision of care uh, comes through uh, the general health care system. In terms of understanding why the Affordable Care Act was so difficult to get enacted, after all, this was not the first effort. Hillary Clinton had made a major effort in 1993 as well. We begin with the fact that 85% of Americans had health insurance before the process began. Not to say that they were in love with their health insurance, but whether it was employer-provided coverage, which was the vast majority, or through government programs for older people, such as Medicare, and for disabled, or for poor people through Medicaid, or even the military through TRICARE. The fact is that 85% of people had some kind of health insurance coverage. As a consequence, this 85-15 formula meant that anything that was going to be proposed was going to make at least 85% of the population nervous that whatever changes were going to be implemented were going to do them more harm than good, and that the other 15% saw all the unlimited upside. Even then, the systems that were in place were not what many people would have wanted. And so we have heard so much about if you wanted to keep your insurance, you could. Exactly what was that insurance that people were so attached to? And many times people had employer-provided coverage that had all kinds of gaps. And I knew a number of people, some of whom had been on the faculty here, who when they switched jobs and got new employer-provided coverage, they had no idea that there would be exclusions for pre-existing conditions or limits. Or more importantly, that they would exclude their spouse the spouse would be covered, but subject to their pre-existing conditions. So that this was not the sort of coverage that many people would have wanted and that they somehow had this emotional attachment to. Further requirements or further aspects of the health insurance that people had were such things as cancellation exposure. For anyone who's had auto insurance, and teenagers in particularly, they know this idea that as soon as you need the insurance, sometimes the insurance company bails out. In healthcare, this has almost a moral dimension, as well as a legal one, that they would cut off services when people are needing them the most and simply choose not to renew. Even worse, and even more peculiar, was the idea of having annual or lifetime caps. There are, of course, caps on all kinds of property insurance, that is, and we're seeing this in Houston now, where the homes are being covered for replacement costs or sometimes fair market value. But in case of health insurance, where the bills can be almost unlimited when there is a true medical emergency, the idea that there would be annual caps flies in the face of the whole concept of insurance, and with the idea that you pay for small expenses on your own and you buy the insurance for the catastrophic event. Then in what universe does it make any sense to have annual, let alone lifetime caps, that even though a person is still sick, even though a person is still under treatment, you've reached your limit, and at this point, your private pay. So it's important to realize that although 85% of people did have health insurance, it may not have been the ideal coverage and may have had some serious limitations. Where this comes about is I was on a talk show and one of the people said, well, they love their coverage and this sort of thing. What did they get out of the Affordable Care Act? Uh, the am amazing 15% of people for whom the benefits are obvious somehow never call in, but that was okay. The other 85% may not have realized that they had these limitations because they were young, they were healthy, they didn't need any health insurance yet, they were the so-called indestructibles. When people find out about this is precisely when they realize that the coverage they had was not really what they thought they had. And that is a consequence of the Affordable Care Act not to defend that, had many serious improvements, even for the 80% or so who had health insurance previously. At the same time, when you're undertaking a reform of one-sixth of the economy, there will be winners and losers. And this is what, of course, spooked the potential losers. 
85% of people were worried that the changes could only make their situation worse. It did not help that they chose not to finance this with an additional tax levy, as many developed countries do, but rather to make internal allocations within the healthcare system. In fact, in 2012, the media pilloried Governor Romney for saying that of the Affordable Care Act was basically financed on the top of Medicare. All they had to do was actually take a look at the committee report that made it very clear that Governor Romney was right. That whether it was called reductions in future growth or specific cuts, they were doing unto Medicare what had historically been done unto Medicaid, which is reduce the amounts that pay providers would be paid, which was just another form of rationing, and that there would be some kinds of waiting lines or other sorts of limits on the care that people had. Yes, you could keep your doctor if, in fact, your doctor was willing to see you. And as a consequence, many people were, were concerned that they would be in this situation. At the same time, it should be noted that although this was dramatic and fairly panic-striking in the minds of people who were on Medicare, this was the situation that Medicaid folks had literally faced for decades. The fact that we were largely copacetic with that approach, perhaps says something about the people who are on Medicaid and how people choose not to identify with that. It recalls the scene in 1993 when then President Clinton was making a speech to the Congress about the need for health care reform. And he made a rather dramatic statement that every American was one paycheck away from being uninsured. It was, of course, an accurate statement and a rather poignant example of what the problem was, but people did not want to hear it. Medicaid were for other people. They did not know them. Perhaps one of the salutary aspects of the 2008-2009 recession is that many people will begin to see that Medicaid is a population not only worthy of dignity, but in fact may have a lot of people that they know personally. Having said that, there are still some major inflection points on health care reform. The cost continuity continuum is a huge issue, meaning that among other things, the more costs that are involved, it's going to be efforts to control those costs, and among other things, there will be more layers of bureaucracy. It is a truism that we see both in health law and in certainly in tax law, that Congress is systematically not suited to take a blank screen or an empty sheet of paper and say, if you were designing this from scratch, how would you do it? Each one of these systems are, are acts of historical accident with path dependency basically defining the system we have. In the article I did uh, on the 50th anniversary of Medicare for the Elder Law Journal, I pointed out that probably the single most disappointing aspect from the standpoint of people on Medicare was that after the single most broad-reaching health care reform legislation in half a century, Medicare was essentially unchanged in its basic structure. In a different article that I have on uh, the outside, I pointed out that Medicare is no picnic, so that people who were advocating, as there was just in, uh, right here in River City at one of the campaign forums yesterday, of Medicare for all. Do you really understand Medicare? Yes, it has a certain universal appeal, but as I pointed out in the article, anyone who first comes on to Medicare is faced with seven major questions that they must confront, many of those being irrevocable decisions. We still have this Part A and Part B, which where people can buy almost uh, sort of seriatim, whether you want hospital services but not doctor care. In what universe would this make any sense? <laughs> the answer is in the universe of 1965, because that's how Blue Cross Blue Shield was set up. That may be, but Blue Cross Blue, Cross, Blue Shield have evolved. Medicare, as Speaker Gingrich once said, is stuck in the time warp of 1965, and the Affordable Care Act really did not make much change in that. And then do you want prescription drugs? Prescription drugs wasn't added to Medicare in 1965 because it was much more episodic. Now it is basically a treatment of regimen, a treatment regimen for people with chronic conditions that ameliorates their health and more importantly keeps them alive. To have a health care program that does not cover, cover prescription drugs is bizarre. Until this change was made during the administration of George W. Bush, Medicare was the only health care system in the world that did not cover prescription drugs. And we were darn proud of it. <laughs> Nevertheless, 
The point is that that was then added, but again with choices. Do you want it at all? Do you want it now? Which one of the plans do you want? And by the way, there's no paper information about it. You must have to go on the internet. No problem for younger people, but for others this was a kind of curious access issue. Nevertheless, what we have, and then I'm not even talking about the private supplements that are necessary to fill the gaps in Medicare that are called Medigap. The point is that this is a serious program that has many benefits but has, is not the sort of co coordinated and integrated care system that many people are used to when they're in the compensated workplace. It does have some key issues and key benefits, namely universal coverage. Interesting aspect of this recent debate has been the threshold question of do we want universal coverage? And just like, even though most developed countries have this, is this even something that we desire? And a surprising number of people apparently have said not necessarily. Apart from issues of cost, it was just the idea of do we even want this at all? If they do, then a number of specific decisions follow from that. Are they going to pay the same price? Or is people going to be rated according to their, their specific risks? So that people who have more risks are going to cost more. It is an amazing thing that some people think that pre-existing conditions are almost a moral fault and that people should pay more for it. It actually took one of the leading national scholars of health law, namely Jimmy Kimmel, uh, to point out <laughs> that in fact many of these existing conditions are completely without fault and that perhaps community rating, meaning that everyone pays the same, is the way to go. Having said that, the only way that's going to work is if we get everyone in the pool. A fundamental phenomenon of insurance is if you let it be completely voluntary, the people who obviously anticipate needing the care will buy it and others will take a chance. This will lead to adverse selection and no insurance system can continue on that basis. In fact, in the Affordable Care Act, they actually had something uh, called the Class Act, which was designed to cover long-term care prior to go into a nursing home, but it was voluntary. And so who do you think would sign up for it? The Department of Health and Human Services did various models and saw there was no way that this would be economical. And since the Affordable Care Act specifically said it had to be self-sustaining, it never went anywhere. They chose not to implement it, and it was ultimately repealed. A comprehensive pool of insureds means, among other things, that you have to have everybody in there. There must be mandates, because some people may choose, particularly if they think they won't need the care, not to get in there. Along with mandates, that must mean that there are going to be serious penalties, not like what Obamacare first came up with, like $200 a year. Even the Americans who have numeracy issues can figure out that $200 a year is going to be way less than what it would cost a monthly premium, and so they made the arithmetic choice simply to pay the penalty. Actually, many of them figured, well, this is part of the tax return, so we won't even pay the $200. But that's an enforcement issue, and the point is there need to be some serious penalties. If there are going to be serious penalties, you can begin to see how the Affordable Care Act's multiple layers, sort of one depends on the other. If there are going to be multiple uh, penalties and serious penalties for failing to participate, what are you going to do about low-income people? Are you going to provide direct subsidies, which tends to be a pejorative to some people, or are we going to use the tax system? The answer was clearly we will use the tax system uh, and specifically have tax credits. Now one of the phenomenons of using the tax system, of course, is people don't get the benefit until the end of the year be it when they file their tax return. For lower income people, this is nonsense because they can't front the premium on their own and accordingly they will have to have it advanced. So they make projections as to what their income will be, get the credits, and what happens if things change in the interim. This is not a hypothetical. This case just came out last week where a people had purchased the Affordable Care Act with credits, turned out to have more income, and now there is a reconciliation necessary. Specifically, the taxpayers, a married couple, qualified on the basis of the husband's income. He was the only one employed. And there's this whole process of different tiers 
of subsidies depending on your income and depending on the four, count them, four separate plans and which bids will be. The technical formula is the second lowest bid for the silver plan. This is sort of aimed at lower income people to help them understand. And so the idea was that the, she quali they qualified for $600 per month. Several months later, the wife got a job. This, of course, produces more income that are already in this year. They notified the covered California, that's the uh, name for the private exchange, the government-run health insurance exchange. They did not get a confirming letter, however, from covered California, or more importantly, the 1095A form, one of three brand new forms for this requirement, that would indicate what they're supposed to do with this. They Californ covered California admitted that they were, quote, so busy that they never get a got around to sending it. Now, this story could just be another example of government efficiency, which I always have trouble getting that phrase out, or it could be rather what President Clinton once said sardonically, that some people think government would mess up a two-car parade. That's really only part of the story here because much of it is that when the case went to the tax court in a full panel decision, they said, with the fact that you didn't get a form, the fact that you are low-income people, that it is very mechanical, you made too much income to get credits. In fact, in your top tier, instead of having to pay some of it back, you paid all of it back. The one concession, and I'm not sure I would call it much, was that the IRS, in its inestimable uh, sort of heart, decided to apply a negligence penalty to this couple as well, and that was a little much for the court, and they said no, there was no negligence. What happens is, this is a schematic of the Affordable Care Act. This is what happens when you engage the Health and Human Services to determine eligibility and then coordinate those transmission of the credits to the state exchanges, all of which to, is to be monitored and reconciled by the Internal Revenue Service. It is pretty amazing, but the reality is if you were to scrap the Affordable Care Act, just academically, and draw a similar schematic of the health insurance program that existed in this country before those changes, it wouldn't look much more fluid. And in fact, with 1,300 private health insurance companies, each with its own definition of many of the procedures, act, ask any practicing physician what this is about, it would be almost as ugly. So the main takeaway here is between the penalties and the low income credits that require courts to be supervening the resolution of it and this kind of overall picture. Is there not a better way? What do other countries do? Well, as we already know, most other countries have a unified universal health insurance program and I'm not going to get into that. That would be indeed be another topic for another day whether that would ever happen in this country with our traditions of private provision of care is very problematic. Plus, there's always the spooky phrase of rationing or waiting lists. This is not a completely trumped up notion. And indeed, I saw a story uh, just the other day of an older Canadian gentleman who wanted hearing aids, contacted the National Health Service of Canada, and was told it was gonna be a five month wait. He was having trouble hearing, and so he went across the border to Minnesota, where he met with an audiologist and received tests and was fitted for a hearing aid that very day. Three weeks later, he came back to that doctor for a follow-up visit. And the doctor asked, how is the hearing doing? He says, wonderful. I can hear everything. This has been a godsend. And the American doctor said, so what does your uh, Canadian family uh, think now about the American health care system? And the gentleman said, oh, they don't know I've been here. I haven't told them a thing. So far, I've changed my will four times. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us to tax. <laughs> One can, uh, can certainly determine whether a person is serious about tax reform by asking, are you going to study the issue? Because if it is, that means they're not. This issue has been studied to death. And so the, one of the best studies was done, actually done under President George W. Bush, where they showed that you could keep a graduated rate structure. You could still have 
a distribution of taxes according to income, but lower tax rates by about a third, going with from a low of 6.6 .6 to 23. Caveat, you had to get rid of every single deduction, exclusion, and credit. I'll repeat, every single deduction, exclusion, and credit, not just the ones that affect your neighbors. With the former, <laughs> the former uh, chair of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, Russell Long, I had a ditty he used to like to recite, don't tax you, don't tax me. Tax that fellow there behind the tree. <laughs> well, in order for this to happen, you're going to have to have every deduction, exclusion, and credit. And then what happens? In the interest of time, this was a fascinating chart. The purplish, dark purple, blue line uh, is the tax rates that applied then. And the pale yellow, the pale uh, light blue line are the tax rates that would apply if you got rid of every single deduction, exclusion, and credit. What I want to focus on is the lavender lines in between. And what that says is if you take on every interest group, if you go after every special interest, if you fight every battle and repeal every deduction, exclusion, and credit, but keep the top tax expenditures, the requisite tax rate to produce equilibrium is that middle line. In other words, unless you go after the top tax expenditures, you really haven't accomplished a whole lot. And what are those top tax expenditures? Not terribly surprising, retirement plan contributions. The entire menagerie of all kinds of tax favored provisions, whether the 401k, the 403b, the 457, the SEP IRA, the individual retirement account, and the other 11, they all enable people to reduce their taxable income currently. That would have to be repealed. This was actually discussed over Labor Day weekend where one of the industry representatives said, we're gung-ho for tax reform. We think rates should be lower, but don't touch retirement plans. That's the single biggest one. The other one that's almost as large are health insurance premiums. Every economist has, has looked at this, has agreed that this is the original sin of health insurance, namely that when the employer provides compensation in the form of additional health insurance, the tax code excludes that from taxable income. In an endowed lecture that became an article, I just go through the World War II history of why that happened. But the fact of the matter is, hello, World War II is over and this should be <laughs> a source of why this should be reviewed now. However, there is a political imperative here. In 2008, Senator McCain made a modest proposal to put a cap on how much health insurance could be received tax-free. Then Senator Obama thought that this was going to be a point of major political vulnerability for McCain and spent literally 40% 40, 40%, 40 of, his, of his political campaign budget targeting Senator McCain on this particular provision. You know the result, and as a consequence, this proposal doesn't seem to have gotten too far. Included in the Affordable Care Act was a very minor attempt at this called the Cadillac Excise Tax. I've written an article in the NYU Review. It's on there. It was originally postponed when it, was, that it had a delayed effective date for eight years to 2018. Don't get excited. Two years ago, they postponed it till 2026. They do this in eight-year intervals because that's two presidential terms. Their idea is that hopefully it'll be gone by then. Also, home mortgage interest. Now we're literally hitting people where you live. And so, yes, even when this means all of these have to be removed, otherwise you don't really gain much. And when pre tax reform in 1986 was being considered, the first question at the press conference to President Reagan was, are you going to do something with the home mortgage interest? He may not have been an in-depth expert on the tax code, but his political instincts were sound. And he said, oh, no, that's off the table. And everyone in the room relaxed. OK, we're still in business. The favor factory known as Congress is still open. And we will begin to see what we want and how it can be. But that means all first homes no, without any limit. The capital gain preference, one of the most historically fraught issues. When people are wondering how come Warren Buffett pays such a low tax, as he himself explains, lower than his own secretary. Well, we don't know, but probably the answer is almost all of his income is capital gains. Do you really want to eliminate that proposal? There have been various suggestions, but in the current Congress, I think that's not even a pipe dream. That's probably unrealistic. 
a child credit over and above the personal exemption, nothing like duplication here, must this be eliminated as well? It doesn't amount to that much money, particularly when it phases out basically for people who can afford to rear children, and so that those uh, are basically not subsidized. But more importantly, this was symbolic. This was to show that the tax code would be more family friendly. And who is going to argue that the tax code should not be family friendly? It's like a politician saying that he likes the tax code the way it is. Another surefire loser. There are others as well, state and local taxes. There are not five states, of which Illinois is the most, where most of the benefit of this goes. And what that would mean is that you would be paying tax to different jurisdictions on essentially the same income. This actually has the biggest chance of being enacted because most of those states that are affected happen to vote Democratic. On the other hand, this is one instance where President Trump has been a great unifier, where Republicans and Democrats from the affected states are doing everything they can to preserve it. There are others as well, the earned income tax credit and the like. Won't go into it, but in terms of saying what is different between now and 1986 in terms of assessing whether there would be tax reform. Well, in 1986, there were 14 tax brackets. Now there are seven. It's a symbolic thing. This is really not a source of complexity. That's why God invented TurboTax. You press the calculate <laughs> button and you don't have to actually go through. But it is powerfully symbolic. And the point is going from 14 to 3, that was impressive. Going from 7 to 3, not nearly so. Even the more sensitive top tax rate when it was 50%, you could talk about going to 33. That was going to be significant. To the extent that President Trump has a proposal on his one page of talking points, he proposes lowering 39.6, cue the timpani, to 35. Wow, that'll really change people's behavior. The capital gain tax rate is essentially the same as it was then. Exactly what are you trying to accomplish? The incidence of the aggravating alternative minimum tax was incidental. This is a, favor, a factor in favor of it, but at the same time, it is now growing. And computer-prepared returns have largely taken much of the sting out of compliance, whereby, for most people, 43% actually file on a 1040E or a 1040EZ. You could put that on a postcard under current law if that was a particular fetish of yours. The real problem, however, is that Congress found out that risk aversion is huge and that when you get rid of hundreds of deductions, exclusions, and credits for the benefit of lowering the tax rate, that the lowered tax rate is less salient. And they pay particular attention to the deductions they lost and less to the rate reduction they got the benefit of. This concept of this basic notion that you can see very political, very little political benefit was encapsulated in this representation of the markup of the tax return. Line one, how much money did you make? Nine, two, send it in. <laughs> that was not true then, but nevertheless what this shows and communicates is that people are so sensitive for the loss of their deductions. That's what they noticed, and they punished the politicians who therefore talk about taking away people's deductions, exclusions, and credits. I will close by noting that the Congress is, of course, the source of any wisdom here, and to their credit, they have created a commission that will, quote, investigate and report on the operation, effects, and administration of the federal system of income taxes and upon any proposals or measures which might be employed to simplify or improve the operation or administration of such taxes. The emphasis is mine. The direct quote, however, is that of the Senate Committee on Finance, published in December of 1925. <laughs> Thank you very much. Congratulations again, Dick. Thank you for uh, an uh, educational and entertaining presentation that I think illustrates why you are so respected and beloved among colleagues and students alike. So congratulations.